the town of ghetto a truck pulls up and it's with a German uh, soldier who's on the truck and as the truck pulls up to the to this area on what's known as Zhidovska Street the Jewish Street it sees a woman who's walking in the street with her two or uh, children she's been recently widowed and she's on her way to the market square where the Jews have been ordered to go to. He stops the truck, he walks to the back of the truck and he opens the door and he takes the two children out of the hand of the woman, the mother, and throws them into the back of the truck. The mother's completely shell-shocked, she doesn't know what to do. He gets back to the truck, he starts driving and she, because of the narrow streets he can't drive very fast, the woman runs after the truck, she manages to get herself onto the driver's side, bangs on the window and orders the German to stop the truck. She wants her kids back. Please give me my children back, give me my children back. The German, it seems like he feels like he's got this fly like buzzing around his ear, but finally he stops. <clears throat> Cannot believe the, the woman's chutzpah to have to stop a truck. Stops the truck. The street is now quiet because he's turned the engine off, apart from the clicking of his rhythmic you know, boots along the co cobblestones. And he goes to the back of the truck and he says, you can have one of them back. Which one do you want? And the, uh, the woman looks at him in quite disbelief. I can have one of my children back. I want them both back. He says to her, you got a minute. Decide what you want to do. And he looks into the truck. She sees him, looks into the truck and she sees her firstborn the one that the parents waited for for so long, the one that brings so much joy to a family, because <clears throat> it's a new experience. And then she looks at the one who is now being spoiled, who has brought life and brought warmth into a family again with his giggles, with his beauty, with his smile. The one who really is now the survivor of the father who unfortunately had passed away. And he barks an order at her that she's got 30 seconds and he says, I want them, she says, I want them both back. And he says, well, you can have one back. And by the way, this decision we know has been taken not just by parents who had to make decisions like this, but we know of kids who had to make decisions, sons who had to make decisions about their parents. Who are they going to take, their mother or their father? He orders her with six, seven seconds to make a choice and she pulls her firstborn out. And the boy who was in the truck is screaming now, Mama, Mama. She's running after the truck as it leaves the ghetto, never to be seen. Tarnov, if more than any other place, is a place of decisions. So you heard decisions. You heard already from Rabbi Garson, he spoke about the idea of Shema Yisrael, <coughs> decisions of parents to put their kids into monasteries. You hear about this story here, and you're going to hear in a moment about other stories. And then we know of other parents who make a decision that they're also going to try and hide their families, okay, their, excuse me, their kids with families, with non-Jewish families. One of them, we know the story quite well. Because one of them, a woman was, uh, who wrote the, the, excuse me, a woman who was saved, she was a little girl at the time, had a letter sewn into her shirt. And we still have the letter to the day of the decisions that parents had to make. Dear Mirilla, I can't believe I have one night to fill a lifetime of love into this letter. Tomorrow morning, if 4am can be called morning, I am giving you up. I am taking you, Mirilla, to the back entrance of dear brave Herman's grocery store and the child's rescuers will be waiting there for you and the 32 other children under the age of three. They'll inject you with a sedative so you won't cry and then they'll slip you off in the pre-dawn with you, my life, my love, out of this barbaric country to safety. We pushed it off, Mirilla. We didn't want to believe we would have to give up our child, probably never to see her again. But this is the last child's rescue. After this, there will be none left to rescue, because tomorrow, our informers tell us, is the last roundup. Tomorrow they come for men, women and children, 
and I've been convinced by these words spoken by our trusted informer Herman, the brave gentle grocer. Any child they take away either dies immediately or dies on the way to the death camp. The word death three times in one sentence. We were the last ones to be convinced to give up our child. He said, finally, with the deepest sadness in every exhausted wrinkle in his face, I cannot force you, but if you keep her with you, she will be dead in a month. They will have no use for babies. She cannot work for them. If you want to give her to us, bring her to the back entrance of my grocery store at 4 a.m. No belongings, whatever food you have, goodbye. Mirala, do you see why I have to give you up? He said no belongings, but I will beg. I will plead that this letter be allowed to go, sewn into your undershirt. And then I will pray to God that the letter stays with you until you are old enough to read it. You must know now why you are alone, without parents. Not because they didn't love you, but because they did. It's eerie to think that by the time you read this, I will probably be dead. That's what Herman, that's what Herman says is going on. People either die immediately or on the way or after a week, after a week or two of forced labour and no food. But I won't have lived in vain, Mirilla. If I know that I have brought you into the world and you will live and survive and grow big and strong and you will be happy, you can be happy, Mirilla, because we loved you. What makes a difference in the lives of adults, it seems, is if they have secure childhoods. Secure with lots of love and acceptance and needs fulfilled and predictable routine and the like. You've had that up to this minute. You'll have it up to 4 a.m., but then you won't. Who knows who will end up taking care of you? Some family who will take you in for money, the money that Herman will pay them. They will surely be kinder to, you, to their own than to you. Here is where the pain mixes with rage. I rage at the animals who are making it possible for you to cry, and I won't be there to comfort you. But you will have this letter, and this letter will make you feel secure. If God answers my prayers, you have us. You have us, Mirilla. Even though you can't see us, we're with you. We're watching you and praying for you. Every time you have troubles, we are pounding on the door to, God, to God's very throne room, insisting on an audience and demanding mercy for our Mirilla down on earth, alone without her parents. And God will listen to us. We won't leave, leave him alone until he agrees that you deserve health, love and happiness. Mirilla, you'll wonder what your first two years were like. You'll wish you could remember. Let me remember for you right now, tenderly on this piece of paper. You like hot cereal in the morning with lots of milk and sugar, except there is no milk and sugar now, none in this whole city. But I will make your cereal anyway, and you eat it with big smiles between every bite. Then you become ready for your nap, so I will rock you after putting the rocker where the sunlight will fall in it. I rock you until you fall asleep, and then I put you in my bed. You sleep well there, you like my smell. What will you smell tomorrow night? Surely nobody will rock you tomorrow, not even in the shade. Oh God, I cannot do it, but I will do it, for you, Mirilla, so you will have at least a hope for life. Mirilla, do me a favour. After you've grown, after this dirty, nightmarish war is over, I know there will be some who underplay the tragedies going on here every day. They will say, a war is a war, it was just a war. Mirilla, tell them about this agony. Tell them how you felt secure in my arms, rocking to sleep in the sunlight. Tell them how your father ran one night, a year ago, to get you medicine, past centuries, whilst breaking a curfew. He risked his life to ease your pain, Mirilla. And now the three of us are being torn apart. Just a war? Tell them, Mirilla, that all the wars in the world don't up to the agony in my heart right now, as I write this. God, it's 2am already. Only two more hours with me, my love, my baby, my Mirilla. I'm going to hold you now, Mirilla, for two hours. Your father and I are going to wake you, feed you, and tell you over and over how much we love you. You're barely two years old. But maybe, if God is good, maybe you'll remember it. And maybe you'll keep this letter until you are old enough to read it. There will be bad times for you, Mirilla, I know. But just think about, just think about me holding you, rocking you to sleep in the sunlight. Keep that sunlight in your heart always. I love you. Your father loves you. May God help us all. Mama.
You're about to enter into a forest. And as we enter into the forest, you'll see a sign on the right hand side which shows strange, wonderful animals you can see deep into the forest, not anywhere where we're going. June 1942, those animals were Jews who were being led from Tarnov. Many of them were running. The sadistic Germans were leaving dead bodies along the way, the whole way, tearing mothers away from their kids, left running around the street not knowing what's happening. Other mothers were picking up children that wasn't even, weren't even their own. And they were being brought to this place over here. Zbilotovska Gore is a sleepy village that really shouldn't have been, been on the map at all. But because of what is about to happen here, this place becomes famous. I'm going to ask us to walk in silence over here into the uh, forest. <laughs> Oh!